This is part nine. Can you believe it? Part nine. We've only got 74 more parts to go. <laughs> you're, you're used to seeing this right by now, right? <clears throat> the topics that we're going to be uh, covering and what we've covered in the first number of weeks together. And uh, we're, we're still on this last part, though. Transmission. The ancient process of accurately copying the Hebrew and Greek scriptures for successive generations. Of course, we've been on that <clears throat> for a long time because the sub, one of the subheadings of that particular topic is Bible manuscripts. And that's what we've been looking at now for a number of weeks, going back to week number five, where we looked at the Old Testament manuscripts. Week six, we started the New Testament manuscripts, and it just so happened there's a whole lot more of stuff to go through concerning the New Testament manuscripts. And last week in our time together, we covered annotations, which are notes that are found in the text, the actual biblical text. We talked about lectionaries. And then we ended our time together talking about text types or textual families. So we're done with those two things. And tonight we're going to be taking a look at major witnesses of the New Testament text. Major witnesses of the New Testament text. We're going to take a look at some specific manuscripts. And um, I'm really hoping you guys are going to enjoy this. I've got some uh, cool things, I think, to look at tonight. So let's pray together and let's just thank the Lord for everything he's doing in our lives and just how great he is. Isn't he a great God? Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. <sighs> Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here this evening, Lord. Father, thank you for settling us here in this room, comfortable room, comfortable environment, protected from the elements, roof over our head, cushions on our seats, shoes on our feet, clothes on our back. Lord, you've given us all the basics. We have all the basics, Lord. We have everything that we need to keep us from being distracted. Lord Jesus, you told us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and just let you handle all the other stuff that we need. And you always handle it, Lord. If we were living in the desert, Lord, you'd give us manna from heaven. You'd make sure our shoes wouldn't wear out. You'd give us a tent to dwell in. Lord, your word says, I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You're such a good God. You meet every need. Lord, you're even meeting our needs physically, even though we have ailments and physical abnormalities, Lord, you, you provide us with doctors. We may have whacked out health care, but at least we have people we can go to and see. <clears throat> Lord, we know that just the fallenness of man is what keeps us from being taken care of maybe in, in some cases. But Lord, you always take care of us. You're always perfect. You always do everything exactly the way it needs to be done. You're a great and awesome God. And it is our privilege this evening, Lord, as it has been for the last number of weeks to look into how we got the Bible that we're holding in our laps or we have on our phones or wherever we have it right now, Lord. Your word has an amazing testimony it's done amazing things in our hearts, but people have gone through some amazing things to get this book into our hands. And it is our privilege tonight to be able to take a look at that and to study it and to make it a, a choice of, of an object of study. So Father, we just pray that you would be glorified tonight because that's what we want, Lord. Everything that we're talking about, manuscripts, text types, all of that, Lord, it points to our great God. And so, Father, would you please just give us wisdom tonight and allow us tonight to have understanding in these things. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So that's obviously one of the reasons why I'm so excited about going through this kind of stuff. Because, you know, when we think about the testimony of the saints, um, 
They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and loved not their lives even unto the death. Well, you know, part of the testimony of God's people through the ages is the fact that there are, have been a whole bunch of people that have made sure that we had the word of God in our hands. They gave their lives for it to make sure that we would have the text that we have in our hands. And so it's cool to be able to go back and look at some of the things that we've been looking at. So let's get back into this. Just like we had with the Old Testament, so too we have New Testament manuscripts that are primary sources for the translations that we have today. How many of you know that the Bible that they had in the synagogues in the time of Jesus was not the King James Version? Does anybody... Does everybody know that? Okay. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> it wasn't any of the English translations at all. And so to prepare us for the next subject, I want to give you all a quick reminder from the end of last week's study. There's going to be some details from the last study that's going to come up again tonight. And so here is a summary of last week's, last week's lesson. And we looked at this very thing last week. Keep this in mind that as individual New Testament books were received and circulated in the early Christian church, various copies were made and deployed throughout the ancient world. And as manuscripts were circulated within particular geographical regions, they began to take on particular characteristics or readings unique to their location, resulting in localized text types or textual families. Remember our four major textual families that we identified last week and those that were, which are studied by New Testament uh, textual critics? We have the Alexandrian text type, the Western text type, the Caesarean text type, and the Byzantine text type. So remember that? Alexandrian, Western, Caesarean, Byzantine text types based primarily upon the region where the manuscripts were either found or written. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the major witnesses, <clears throat> Greek New Testament manuscripts, from which our translations are made today. Let's start by taking a look at introduction to the major witnesses. This is really cool. The discovery and identification of New Testament manuscripts continues to this day with numerous manuscripts being identified around the world. Many, if not most, of these manuscripts were discovered a long time ago and are now housed in various museums or libraries, especially church libraries of various sorts. Many of them have just recently been discovered and identified due to the changing political situation around the world, in which libraries that were previously inaccessible are now potentially open to scholars. Most of these manuscripts are of late date, and often are lectionaries, talked about that last week, or minuscules, we talked about that too. A few are unseals, remember you got Unseals, minuscules, unseals, all caps, minuscules, all lowercase and italicized. A few are unseals and even fewer are of earlier date. A few papyri are still regularly published, some with fairly early dates. Papyri were the manuscripts that were found in uh, um, the area of Egypt. We'll get into that more later on. Arguably, the most important person to discover identify and publish New Testament manuscripts is the German scholar from Leipzig, Constantine von Tischendorf. Living in the 19th century, Tischendorf devoted his career as a scholar to discovering and publishing as many Greek New Testament, as well as other biblical and other language, manuscripts as he could find so that he could establish the early reliability of the New Testament text. He undertook this task in direct opposition to the rise of German higher criticism, which was increasingly skeptical of the reliability of the New Testament. 
in the course of his travels to various places around Europe and the Middle East, Tischendorf discovered, identified, and published more manuscripts than any other scholar in history before or since. Pretty cool, huh? We'll talk about him a little bit more later on. By and large, it is believed that most of the important copies of the scriptures are the oldest. That's what most scholars believe anyway. Here, are, here we are very fortunate indeed for among the very valuable papyri are about 50 that date from the second to the fourth century. Now that's a long time ago. That's real close to the originals. In addition, our oldest vellum manuscripts are complete or almost complete copies of the New Testament and have practically all of the Old Testament as well. The first three manuscripts that we're going to look at tonight are amongst the oldest large ones that we have in our possession. They date back to between 300 and 450 AD. Aged, worn, faded, and unattractive in many respects. These are the greatest documentary treasures in Christendom, the oldest Bibles in the world. Ready to take a look at this? First one we're gonna to cover tonight is one that maybe you've heard of before, known as Codex Vaticanus. Now, some people will just refer to it with the letter B, okay? All of these have some sort of letter or number designation. Codex Vaticanus. This fourth century manuscript is acknowledged wi widely as being the most important witness on the text of the New Testament. As its name implies, it is located in the Vatican Library in Rome. It has resided there at least since 1481, the date of a catalog in which it is listed. But the library was founded in 1448, and the manuscript may have been one of the original volumes of the collection. The Vatican manuscript is a rare gem in that it contains in Greek almost all of the Old Testament, excuse me, Old and New Testaments. At one time, the Codex originally contained the whole Greek Bible, including most of the books, books of the Apocrypha, interestingly enough. But it has lost many of its leaves. Originally, it must have had about 820 leaves or 1,640 pages. But now it has 759 leaves, 617 in the old, 142 in the new. The beginning has been lost as far as Genesis 46, 28. Some of the Psalms are also missing, 106 through 138. And the ending likewise has dropped off from Hebrews 9, 14 to the close. <clears throat> uh, the letters of Timothy, Titus, and Revelation. The general epistles are, uh, epistles are included after the book of Acts, following the usual order of many Greek manuscripts. Now you guys can probably guess that the order that we have them in today is not necessarily in the order they were written, okay? And there are different order, orders of, or arrangements of the books depending on what manuscript you have. Certain textual evidence points to Egypt and Alexandria as the place of production. It is bound in book form, a codex, and embraces 759 leaves of the finest vellum. Each page is about 10 inches square and holds three columns of writing, which originally were very handsome. The beauty of the handwriting has been marred by some later scribe who thought he could do future generations a great service by tracing over the text whose ink was beginning to fade. The scribe would have performed a greater service if he had left the manuscript alone, for even after more than 1,600 years, the original ink has not faded from view. Interesting, isn't it? It is distressing that this manuscript is not entirely complete, yet in spite of its gaps, it is considered to be the most exact copy of the New Testament known. It is believed to be the earliest of the great unseals, and the many extensive studies which have proved its text to be of purest quality 
confirm this judgment. The printed texts of the Greek New Testament, Greek New Testament today rely heavily on the Vatican Codex. And uh, here's a couple, couple of pictures of it. Uh, look, you, you can even see that I got a little bit of color in there. Doesn't that look nice? Not bad for a 1600 and plus year old manuscript. Now I thought this was kind of cool. You can actually purchase a facsimile of the manuscript. In fact, that is what is located in the Museum of the Bible down in Washington, D.C. It is my understanding that in 1999, the Vatican permitted 450 facsimile copies to be made and given out, divvied out to various museums and so forth. And this is an actual copy of the, uh, it's a, the facsimile of it, but the facsimile captured it exactly. Even the, uh, all the blemishes on the pages and everything. It looks like the real thing. Uh, it's bound kind of like the real thing. And um, just to let anybody know who, who's interested in, in this, I actually was able to track down a copy. So if anyone wants to bless, anyone wants to bless me with that gift, it's only $6,000. And uh, I can send you the, the link where you guys can grab me a copy of that if you want. But, uh, but just beautiful. I couldn't believe how, how pristine the copy of it looked. So there you have Codex Vaticanus. Secondly, let's take a look at Codex Sinaiticus, also known as, known as Aleph for the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. That's what it's designated as. Codex Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus excuse me, or Aleph. Of almost equal importance to the Vatican manuscript is Codex Sinaiticus. It is also known as the Sinaiticus, excuse me, Sinaitic manuscript because it was discovered by the great textual critic Constantine Tischendorf at St. Catherine's Monastery situated at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now this manuscript has a very interesting story behind it. And we're just, this is the Reader's Digest version. This isn't going to be the whole, the whole shebang. But on a visit to the monastery in 1844, he noticed in a waste bucket some parchment leaves that were being used to light the lamps. <laughs> he was allowed to take this waste paper, which proved to be 43 leaves from various parts of the Greek translation of the Old Testament. He was shown other sections of the Old Testament, but was not allowed to have them. So in 1853, he made a second trip to the monastery and found nothing. In 1859, however, on his third trip, he found not only other parts of the Old Testament, but also the complete New Testament. He was finally able to persuade the monastery authorities to present the manuscript to the czar, the great patron of the Greek Catholic Church, who placed it in the Imperial Library in St. Petersburg. The Tsar gave great honors to the monastery and its authorities, and everybody seemed well pleased. Later, Tischendorf was charged with having stolen the manuscript from its lawful owners, but the better textual scholars do not accept that story. So there's, there's discrepancy about whether or not that was true. The manuscript remained in the Imperial Library until 1933 when it was purchased by the British Museum for the huge sum of 100,000 pounds. Textual criticism made the headlines when one manuscript was bought for half a million dollars, which is how much 100,000 pounds was back then, raised largely by public subscription during the Great Depression. Imagine that. This guy spends $500,000 on a manuscript during the Great Depression. The manuscript is now on display in the manuscript room of the museum where it is considered one of the museum's most prized possessions. Boy, would I love to go see that manuscript at the uh, museum there in, in uh, London. Codex Sinaiticus contains the entire Old Testament and the entire New Testament in this order. 
four gospels, Pauline epistles, including Hebrews, Acts, general epistles, Revelation. The manuscript contains 346 leaves of fine parchment written in four columns. The style of its script, along with other factors, make it quite certain that it was copied about the middle of the fourth century. The codex cannot be earlier than 340, the year Eusebius died because the Eusebian sections of the text are indicated in the margins of the Gospels by a contemporary hand. Most scholars date it 350 to 375 AD. It was copied probably by three different scribes. The three different spellings of various words make it possible to distinguish between the hands. Very interesting. The Sinaitic manuscript is the oldest complete manuscript of the New Testament that exists today. This, of course, makes it unique. Its importance, however, lies in the antiquity and the quality of its text. Tisendorf greatly used the textual evidence of Codex Sinaiticus in preparing his critical editions of the Greek New Testament. Uh, I actually have a critical edition of his Greek New Testament. I had it here a few weeks ago. Some of you came up and took a look, uh, took a look at it then, but uh, pretty cool. Extensive studies have classed it in type with the Vatican manuscript, which means that the two most important witnesses on the Greek New Testament are the Vatican and Sinaitic codices. And it, along with Codex Vaticanus, are considered to be Alexandrian text types. They're from that family of, of text types. And uh, got uh, two pictures up here of it. Um, I'm gonna have some testimonies. I don't have it here, but I'm gonna have some interesting testimonies to share about uh, some of these codexes concerning something that's missing in some Bibles from the Gospel of Mark. Talk about that later on. But that's a, that's a single page there, and then the whole thing combined looks something like that. Isn't that amazing? Pretty not bad looking for a book that's 1,600 and some odd years old, wouldn't you say? Amazing. God preserving his word for us, even in the ashes we find preserved copies of it. Simply amazing. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Here's another major testament, major manuscript, I should say. Codex Alexandrinus. Codex Alexandrinus. Next in rank among the large vellum unseals, those first two manuscripts we looked at were unseals, is Codex Alexandrinus. The name Alexandrinus comes from ancient records suggesting that it was copied in Alexandria, Egypt during the early part of the 5th century AD. The early history of this manuscript and its Egyptian provenance is partially revealed by its fly leaves. Little notes that were written on the side. A note by Cyril of Lucar, patriarch of Alexandria, Alexandria, excuse me, and then of Constantinople in the 1620s, states that according to tradition, it was written by Thecla, a noble lady of Egypt, shortly after the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, and that her name was originally inscribed at the end of the volume, but the last page was lost due to mutilation. An Arabic note of the 13th or 14th century also says that the manuscript was written by Thecla the Martyr. Another Arabic note says that it was presented to the patriarchal, patriarchal cell of Alexandria. Cyril of Lucard, I'm not gonna give you who all these people were, I'm just reading right out of this particular resource. Cyril of Lucard took the manuscript from Alexandria 
to Constantinople in 1621 and then gave it to Charles I of England in 1627 where it became part of the Royal Library, then later the British Museum. Although at present the Alexandrian manuscript is bound in four volumes, each bearing the royal arms of Charles I, originally it formed one volume. Only 773 of the original estimated 820 pages still exist. The rest were lost as the book was passed down through the centuries. That shouldn't surprise us too much. I mean, we've seen pages drop out of the books. In fact, I've seen a few of our Bibles in the pews here that have lost some pages, so that's not too surprising, is it? The surviving parts of the Alexandrinus contain a Greek translation of the whole Old Testament, the Apocrypha, including four books of Maccabees and Psalm 151, and most of the New Testament. Now this is interesting. Appended at the end of the New Testament are 1st Clement and a portion of so-called 2nd Clement. Concerning these additional books, it should be said that 2nd Clement is a sermon from the mid-2nd century. First Clement is a letter presumably written by Clement of Rome about AD 95 and it is generally classified with the writings known as the Apostolic Fathers. Now, evidently, the scribes or scribe of this codex used what's known as exemplars, text that it was copied from, used of this codex used exemplars of varying quality for various sections of the New Testament. The exemplar used for the Gospels was of poor quality, reflecting a Byzantine text type. Alexandrinus' testimony in the epistles is much better and in Revelation it provides the best witness to the original text. Anyone who visits the British Library or looks Closely at photographs of the manuscript can observe noticeable features that distinguish it from the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts. The form of the handwriting is heavier. Certain letters are finished off with added touches. And large letters are used to mark paragraphs. And red ink is used for the first line or lines of each book. We talked about that last week or maybe the week before. <laughs> Such features of the manuscript make it possible to date it sometime in the 5th century. One last thing about this manuscript, very interesting. As for the quality of its text, this varies in different sections of the manuscript. This should not be thought surprising because the various New Testament books at first circulated as single volumes or in combinations of several volumes together, which made it necessary for a scribe to employ several manuscripts in, in the making of a complete New Testament. Codex A evidences this for its type of text in Acts, the epistles, and Revelation is very good, similar to that of Vatican and Sinaiticus, uh, Sinaitic manuscripts, while its text in the four Gospels is not as good, similar to a form of the text that came to predominate in later manuscripts. It is classified generally as a Byzantine text type. And what's interesting about it is, if you look at it, and I don't, I don't have them side by side here, but you can definitely tell, well, upon close inspection, you can tell that there are some differences uh, in the type of lettering that there is. You can see there at the beginning of sections how the author, the scribe used capital letters, uh, two columns instead of three or four columns, a lot of differences there. But this particular manuscript is, and by the way, this is uh, Second Peter and the beginning of First John, interestingly, but, uh, or the end of Second Peter and the beginning of First John. But here we have an ancient manuscript, not of the Alexandrian text type, Byzantine text type. Now, let's take a look at uh, two more, two more before we close tonight. Let's talk about the Codex Washingtonianus, 
or the Freer Gospels, which is named after its owner, Charles Freer. Codex, this is also, these are two manuscripts we're talking about here, both owned by Charles Freer. Codex Washingtonian, Washingtonianus, and these two manuscripts are also designated as W and I. W and I. Codex I contains a collection of Paul's letters from 1 Corinthians through Hebrews, with Hebrews being placed after 2 Thessalonians. The text is Alexandrian in type, dating back to the 5th century, but unfortunately, less than half of the manuscript has survived. Now, that's one part of this group of manuscripts. Codex W is dated from the 4th or 5th century. It has the four Gospels and Acts and was copied from a parent manuscript, again, an exemplar, that had been pieced together from several different manuscripts. It is suggested that the parent manuscript was probably put together shortly after Diocletian, after the Diocletian persecution, when manuscripts of the New Testament were scarce. The text came from North Africa, the Western text we talked about last week. For the first part of Mark, the scribe and the scribe of W used manuscripts from Antioch for Matthew and the second part of Luke to fill gaps in the more ancient manuscript which he was copying. Detailed textual analysis reveals the variegated textual stratifications, which just simply means the putting together of different textual categories or families. Detailed analysis reveals that the variegated textual stratifications of W as follows. Now check this out. This is a very, it's a, it's a very eclectic, I guess you could say, manuscript. In Matthew, the text is Byzantine. In Mark, the text is first Western, then Caesarean in Mark. So that's why I wanted to go through those text types again. In Luke, the text is first Alexandrian, then Byzantine. John is more complicated. The first section of John has a mixture of Alexandrian and Western readings, as does the rest of John. <laughs> the extreme textual variation in this manuscript reveals the tremendous liberties the scribes exerted in producing the codex. They not only they not only selected various exemplars of various portions of each gospel, as many as seven different exemplars, but they also harmonized and filled in textual gaps. So in other words, here we have, imagine they find these codexes, and they're looking at these codexes. They can tell they were made probably around the same time, but they're looking and they see very clear differences in the way the text is written out. <clears throat> that would be like someone finding writings by me and it's on maybe the same type of paper and they find writings for me and, you know, like I said a few weeks ago, I write in all caps. And somebody's going, okay, this is all caps. And then they, they pick it up from one of you guys that writes in all cursive. Same type of paper and everything, same, maybe even the same ink color. Like, okay, well, that's a, that looks like uh, so-and-so's writing, and then somebody else's writing that looks different from that, and so scribes or textual critics are trying to figure out what, you know, what this all means. So here we have this great variety in this particular text, and I actually do have a picture of this one I was able to track down. There is a, uh, a photograph of this codex Washington manuscript, I guess I can just call it that, Codex <coughs> Washingtoni, Washingtonianum, whatever it is, <laughs> W, let's just call it W, <laughs> but amazing. Fifth century, right around there. Last one we're going to look at tonight, very well-known 
codex known as Codex Beza. Codex Beza. Codex Beza, also known as Codex D. Codex Beza is named for Theodore Beza, John Calvin's friend, who after obtaining it near Lyons, France, during the wars of religion, gave it in 1581 to Cambridge University in whose library it still lies. Now this is an interesting manuscript because it is a bilingual manuscript. Greek on the left page facing Latin on the right page. So it's what's known as a diglot. Two different languages in one, in one text. It contains the four gospels in the Western order, Ma Math, excuse me, Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark, and Acts with a small fragment of 1 John. Perhaps originally it had revelation also. It is dated in the 4th or 5th century. A long series of correctors and annotators have worked on it, some amending the text, others adding liturgical notes. Its place of origin has caused much debate, and it is still not quite settled. Greek was the language of the region and of most of the later annotators. This Codex is probably the most controversial of the New Testament unseals because of its marked independence. Its many additions, omissions, and alterations, especially in Luke and Acts, are the work of a significant theologian. A few earlier manuscripts appear to be precursors to the type of text found in D, this manuscript, which is considered the principal witness of the Western or D type text. Thus, Codex Beza could be a copy of an earlier revised edition. The redactor, which is someone who puts text into appropriate form for publication, that's what redactor means, must have been a scholar who had a propensity for adding historical, biographical, and geographical details. More than anything, he was intent on filling in gaps in the narrative by adding circumstantial details. It's also believed that whoever it was that wrote this manuscript, that they probably were more of a Latin scholar, just by the way that the letters looked, the, la the Latin letters looked exactly the way they're supposed to, and then the Greek letters kind of maybe have a little bit of a Latin flair to them, even though it's Greek. But anyway... Here's a, some interesting things to note about this particular text. <clears throat> of the many distinctive readings of the manuscript, the following deserves special attention. It is the oldest manuscript to contain the story of the adulterous woman. The genealogy of Jesus in Luke's gospel is arranged in reverse order so as to conform more closely with that in Matthew. It is the oldest manuscript to contain most of the longer ending of Mark. We're going to talk about that one when we get into, the, into uh, English Bibles. So there you have it. And this is what it looks like. So you've got uh, Greek over here on the left, Latin over here on the right. Lots of scribbles, lots of emendations. But here we have a very, very old manuscript dated somewhere between the 4th and the 5th century A.D. Uh, Codex Beza, a.k.a. the D manuscript. Now, um, I wanted to show you guys just real quickly here a couple of charts that I found. Um, a chart, this chart here indi indicates notable Byzantine manuscripts. Remember we talked about the different textual families? Well, certainly two of the main ones are the Byzantine family and the Alexandrian family. The Byzantine family, as we discussed, was the family of manuscripts that were used to translate the King James Bible, the manuscripts that Erasmus used to make the Greek text from which the King James Bible was translated, at least the New Testament part of the King James Bible. And so here's a whole list, and I know these are too small to read, but I just wanted to throw it up here for you just to take a look at this. And then here's another chart that has the notable 
Alexandrian manuscripts, and a lot of a lot of the ones that are in here, interestingly, are the uh, papyri fragments, or some of the papyri manuscripts. And we're going to, Lord willing, look at uh, the papyri next week. I don't have time to do it tonight. But one last thing I want to leave you with tonight is this. So here we we dig up all these manuscripts, right? And we've got manuscripts, fourth century. Uh, fifth century, the ones that we looked at tonight, they're all old. Very, very old. <clears throat> but one last thing we need to consider when we're looking at manuscripts and we're, we're piecing together things and we're trying to come to, to grips with what the original text should say. And by the way, what the original text should say is what we have. Okay, But consider this from the perspective of people that translated the text from these manuscripts to get this book into our hands, all right? So we've got little checks and balances that we use. We've got lots of manuscripts that we're working with, but there's one last thing that scholars have been able to use the, to help them ascertain whether something is original, whether it actually belongs in the text, and that is the early church fathers. Quotations of the New Testament from the early church fathers, referred to as patristic quotations, also play an important role in reconstructing the New Testament text in that they give us insight into what text types were available and in use when and where they wrote. In some cases, this makes the church fathers a more certain source than Greek manuscripts since the date and the geographical location of the church fathers are usually easy to ascertain. Despite their importance for textual criticism, the early church fathers remained one of the most understudied, understudied witnesses to the New Testament text. Although these are not primary sources, they can, with proper handling, provide insights into the New Testament text. So in other words, they're not gospel, okay? But we can look at these patristic quotations, these early church fathers, and we can see where they quoted a text. And we can say, oh, look at that. And they may even have a reference there. The, the writer Luke said this. And we look through these Luke manuscripts. Look, there it is right there. How about that? So that's, that's what a scholar is up against. And just... We have to have at least a little bit of sympathy and pity for people that were doing this before electronic media. I mean, come on, guys. So picture these guys, these scribes. They've got, I don't know how they did it, a bunch of tables laid out in front of them with all these manuscripts together. And they're going to each one and calculating and formulating. I mean, today... Most of these, all of these have been digitized. You can buy copies of the digital images. I have copies of Codex Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Washingtonius, Alexandrianus. I have those in a software package. <clears throat> and as I showed you a few weeks ago, um, one particular software package I have even took the time to tag them. So all the scripture <coughs> references are there on the manuscript, which weren't in the original manuscripts. And we have the value, the, the benefit of having all of these things scanned and people continue to examine them today. I know one gentleman who's, who's working on his PhD and he's, he's working on one fragment of a papyri, squeezing everything he can out of that papyri fragment. And, and there's nothing wrong with that because one of the reasons why we have such a reliable text is because of the work these men have put into getting it to us, of digitizing it so that we can put it on our phone and have it on our iPads and have it everywhere. But that also brings to mind something else, and with this I'll close. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. This also means greater accountability for us, doesn't it? Because 
we can really cross-check things, can't we? We can cross-check things with different translations that we have. Uh, my New American Standard says, what, is it, what does the NIV say there? What, what's the New Living Translation say? How about the Net Bible, the King James? I mean, we can cross-check. <clears throat> We've got cross-references in our Bibles. We can go crazy with this stuff in a good way. We, we, we use it in a way that brings glory to God. So, are we all reading our Bibles regularly? I can tell you what, these guys read their Bibles regularly. They had it in front of their eyes every day, looking at it over and over and over and over and over and over. <clears throat> now, some of them weren't even believers. Most of the ones we've looked at, uh, the, some of the scholars we talked about were believers, but <clears throat> some of the guys that look into this stuff, they're, they're not believers. They're just ar archaeologists, you know, they're, they're interested in this stuff because it's part of antiquity. <clears throat> but we have a whole lot of people who are believers. And they're looking over this, and we should be looking over this. We should be studying this. Because this is how we get to know God. We study his word. We read his word. We dig into it. We use Bible dictionaries. We want to know geography. We want to know Greek. We want to know Hebrew. We want to <clears throat> read theology as it relates to the Bible. We want to get into it. We don't need to necessarily be scholars in, in the sense of having some sort of an academic credential behind our names, but we are told to study to show ourselves approved, right? Right? to be diligent, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen who rightly handle the word of truth. Hmm, didn't we just study that this last Sunday? Yeah, we did, didn't we? And so we have a responsibility to dig in and to be enthralled by it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. So, a lot of stuff tonight. I know that we... we, we <clears throat> read a lot of stuff. Maybe some languages that was in there that was a little over our heads. <coughs> um, sometimes it's not easy to break all of it down into its simplest, simplest form as much as I want to. But hopefully you've got a good flavor tonight of, of the the kind of information that's out there, <clears throat> out there for anybody to read, look at. Information that helps us in our study of God's word. And I pray that God gives us a heart to want to know him more. <clears throat>